If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it up to the book of Ezekiel, chapters 26 uh, through 28. And we're going to be talking about destructive pride. Let's ask God's uh, blessing on His Word. Shall we do that? Our Father, as we open up the Scriptures, it is our desire that the Spirit of God would teach us and you would guide us in the truth that we must have for ourselves. And we thank you for this portion of your word. We pray, God, that, as, uh, that you would do a work that man cannot do uh, by the power of your Spirit in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We probably all are familiar with uh, Proverbs 16, 18. Uh, it says, uh, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And I, I want us to think about the destructive power of pride, the destructive power of that, that pride happens and then comes destruction. And we get this haughty, proud spirit, and then a fall is about to come. So th- we need to think about the background of um, Ezekiel chapter 26 through 28. And really it has to do with two cities, Tyre and Jerusalem. And on a map, um, you can see it like this. Clear up there at the top is circled in red um, the city of Tyre. It was a coastal port city on the Mediterranean Sea. It became the major trading center for ships coming as far away as Spain and shipping goods back and forth all through the Mediterranean area. Uh, Tyre controlled the sea trade. But Jerusalem, down further south, Jerusalem controlled the caravan routes that went to Egypt and to the rest of the Middle East. And so there was a competition between shipping by caravan and shipping by ship. And uh, that uh, competition uh, wasn't always very friendly. Well, then history took place and the Babylonian Empire emerged. And in 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem, conquered it, And in 605 was the first deportation of the Jews. And at that time, Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were taken to uh, Babylon. And then in 597 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came back to Jerusalem. A second deportation of Jews took place then. And in that deportation, the prophet Ezekiel was taken to Babylon. So when he writes this book you have open, Ezekiel, he is writing from Babylon. And uh, as he writes uh, from, from Babylon, he's writing about this coastal city, these hundreds of miles away, the coastal city of Tyre. Then in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came a third time, and this time he destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and that was actually the end of the kingdom of Judah. And so Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. All who could make the journey were deported those 700 miles to the, to the Babylonian Empire. The city was burned and the walls were torn down. The temple was destroyed. and The kingdom of Judah came to an end, at least for that part of history. What was then the rival city, Tyre? What was their reaction to the destruction of Jerusalem? Remember, they are rivals in trade. 
So what was Tyre's reaction? Well, the city nation of Tyre gloats over Jerusalem's destruction and sees this as an opportunity to expand and to monopolize trade. We can be sure that as word came to the city of Tyre that their shipping rival Jerusalem was destroyed, that there were probably many unpleasant memories that had happened, things through the years of their competition, that would have come to mind. And now finally, this rival is no more. Well, so they gloat over it. They rejoice over the destruction of Jerusalem. Let me just say that God does not like it when people rejoice at the hardship of others. He doesn't like that. Especially his chosen people, Israel. God had said this of his people, Israel. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. It's still in effect today, by the way. Be careful that you're not anti-Semitic. Isn't that right, Jackie? Jackie's part Jewish, and so I'm... Yes. So, um, so then we, that brings us to Ezekiel 26 through 28. God's four prophecies, or oracles, against Tyre. And the first prophecy is in chapter 26. Each of these prophecies will begin the same way. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, this is Ezekiel talking, but he's quoting God. Son of man, because Tyre has said concerning Jerusalem, Aha! The gateway of the peoples is broken. It is open to me. I shall be filled now that she is laid waste. Speaking of the trade routes, now there's a, a freedom for that and no more paying tolls to ship through Judah. Verse 3, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you, as the sea brings up its waves. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her, her towers, and I will scrape her debris from her and make her a bare rock, which is kind of a play on words because the word Tyre itself means rock. And so God is going to make it a bare rock. Verse 20, verse 7 says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the king of kings, with horses and chariots and cavalry and a great army, and he will slay your daughters on the mainland with the sword, and he will make siege walls against you and cast up a ramp against you, and raise up a large shield against you. The blow of his battering rams he will direct against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. So, essentially, in that first, in that first prophecy, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be the one who destroys the city he destroyed already Jerusalem, and now he will come to Tyre. Prophecy number two is a lament over Tyre's destruction. And what this lament is, if we, we won't read the whole thing, but uh, the lament is that the countries that used to be involved in trade with Tyre will be greatly grieved at Tyre's destruction because now... That's an end to trade agreements, it's an end to enterprises, 
and uh, it, you know it's sh- it's going to shut down the shipping industry uh, in the Mediterranean as far as the Middle East is concerned. And so this lament is made by the nations that used to trade with Tyre. Chapter 27, we read about this lament. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, take up a lamentation, which is a funeral dirge, over Tyre, and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrance to the sea, merchants of the peoples to the coastlands. Thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the heart of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They have made all your planks of fir trees from cedar. They have taken a cedar from Lebanon to make a mast for you. Your wealth, your wares, your merchandise, your sailors, and your pilots, and your repairs of seams, and your dealers in merchandise, and all your men of war who are with you, with all your company that is in your midst, will fall into the the heart of the seas on the day of your overthrow. Verse 28, at the sound of the cry of your pilots, the pasture lands will shake. All who handle the oar, the sailors, and all the pilots of the sea will come down from their ships. They will stand on the land. And they will make their voice heard over you and will cry bitterly. They will cast dust on their heads, which is a sign of of mourning back in those ancient days. They will wallow in ashes, another sign of of great grief. Also, they will make themselves bald for you. They will shave their heads, another sign of grief. And gird themselves with sackcloth. They will weep for you in bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. So every, every sign in the ancient ancient world of grief will be done by these people. And the reason all this is mentioned is to point out that the grief of these trading partners will be so great. I mean, they're shut. This is a huge economic disaster. And they're all mourning. Not because they love Tyre so much. It's just that they were, it was so important as far as trade goes. Verse 32, Moreover, in their wailing, they will take up a lamentation for you and lament over you. Who is like Tyler? Like her who is is silent now in the midst of the sea. So that was the second prophecy. The third one comes in chapter 28, and it's the first 10 verses. It's it's a prophecy number three, the ruler of Tyre will be judged. I want you to notice that is the prince of Tyre. This will be contrasted with the final prophecy, which will be against the king, not the prince, but the king. So we're going to have a change of word there. Now, it's not in your text, but we know from history that at that time, the prince of Tyre was Eth Baal. And you will see in his name the god Baal. And many times uh, people were named after, uh, after Baal. Um, and uh, after other gods as well. So this is against the prince of Tyre, who was Eth Baal the third, and he will be judged for his pride. And I want you to notice when we read, read this, it's in the future tense. Now, Eth Baal the third ruled from 591 
to 573. He was the ruler when, um, uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed. All right, so chapter 28, verses 1 through 10 says this. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am what? A God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of of the seas, yet you are a man and not a god, though you set your heart as the heart of a god. Behold, and here is some satire. Did you know that God uh, often used satire? He did. It does. In Scripture, you'll find that quite a bit, that God will. Uh, he uses satire, and here he uses it. Behold! You are wiser than Daniel, or so you think. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. Remember, to Daniel was revealed, not because of who Daniel was, but because of who God is, that to Daniel were revealed secrets. What is interesting to me is that, of course, Ezekiel is writing from Babylon. He knows all about, he knows all about uh, uh, Daniel. But, Daniel needs no explanation in the text as this message goes all the way back to the Mediterranean coast. The reputation of Daniel has preceded this message, and there's no explanation needed. And it's easy just to make satire here, because everybody back in, in the West knows all about Daniel and how God has uh, caused him to be exalted and, and reveal secrets through him. Verse 4, with your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself. You've gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and trade, you've increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. You know, that often happens. You remember what Jesus said about rich people? He said it's easier for a rich person to go, or for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, but probably for a rich person to go through the eye of a needle too. <laughs> but easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. Because quite often our riches make us so proud of our accomplishment, we feel we don't need God. Uh, it would seem that Ethbaal has come to the conclusion, you know, I, I'm successful like nobody else. Maybe I really am a god. I, I figure out how to make money like nobody else can. I really am kind of a god. I, I guess I am a god. Shirley MacLaine used to say, I am god, I am god. I saw a cartoon once of it was depicting God and Gabriel, and they're looking down on the seashore, and there's Shirley MacLaine. I am God, I am God. And God says to Gabriel, blow some sand in her eyes. <laughs> Ow! She can't control anything in her environment after all. Ethbaal's, the third's pride. Your heart is lifted up in pride. You think you are a god. You think you're wiser than Daniel. You think you're so smart because of your wealth. But here's the judgment that would come to him. God will bring nations against him. Verse 6 says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of God, Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations. Secondly, his beauty will be ruined. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. 
they shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die in the depth in the death, or the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. And thirdly, he would die in disgrace. Verse 9, will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? Will you still be singing that song? I don't think so. But you shall be a man and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. Verse 10 says, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. Now, die the death of the uncircumcised is just a phrase that means you will die in shame. You will die a shameful death. Rather than in splendor, there'll be nothing of glory in your death. Now, that brings us to prophecy number four, which is the climax of this series of four. And here it's the king of Tyre, which actually is Satan, has already been judged. As you read through this text, you notice that the judgment's always in the past tense. Up to this point, it's all been future tense. And now it moves to the past tense. Because the real king of the city of Tyre, that is the one who ruled the hearts of the people of Tyre and ruled the heart of their leader, Ethbaal III, was none other than Satan. And the sin of Satan, pride, was the sin of Ethbaal III and the sin of the whole city. They, the whole city had the mentality of pride. Which leads me to wonder, who is the real king of the United States? I don't believe it's God. In the thinking of the majority of people in the United States. Who is directing our attitudes? If you're old enough to remember, there was a time when being a Christian was an honorable, respectable thing in the United States. And if you quoted something from the Bible, it brought respect to an, to an opinion. That time is gone for the majority of people in the United States. Who is the king that rules over this nation? That is, the one who rules in the majority of the hearts of people. Well, there was no throne visible, no, no uh, wonderful, splendid throne that you could see in the city of Tyre where, the, where Satan sat, but he did sit in the, on the throne of people's hearts. Our founding fathers in this country intended this to be a Christian nation. So who then is the prince of the power of the air in the United States? Is it not Satan who directs the moral and political downfall of this country? Verse 11. Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation, that's a funeral dirge, over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You, speaking about the king, had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. I noticed three things there. Seal of perfection. 
There was absolutely nothing wrong with this wonderful cherub that God created. He was absolutely perfect. You see, God did not create Satan as a bad um, uh, creature. He created him perfect. He was the very seal of perfection, and he was full of wisdom and absolutely perfect in beauty. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, and the lapis, uh, lazu, lie, <laughs> the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were born, does it say? No, created. They were prepared. Notice three things. You were in Eden. You were adorned with every precious stone. You were created and not born. All descriptions of this wonderful cherub that God had placed there. Verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. And I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. Let's point out the three things here. You were the anointed cherub. Now, when you think of somebody being anointed, what comes to your mind? When somebody is anointed for something, what does that mean? Say, okay, they're special. They, if you have an anointing, that's a special empowerment that would come to you from God. An anointing would be a, a very special and unique empowerment that comes uh, to you. He says, you were the anointed cherub. He wasn't the only cherub, but he was the one that was anointed who covers. And this seems to indicate that he had one of his tasks was to protect the holiness of God in the little phrase, you cover. And probably that was a protection of the holiness of God. And I, says God, placed you there. Not only that, you were on the holy mountain of God, which is another way of saying that you had free access to my throne, God says. You were there at the throne. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire, which is a, maybe a little hard to understand, but I think what it means is that in all the descriptions of the throne of God, there's a presence of fire at the base of the throne of God. And probably this just simply means you were a powerful cherub and you walked, among, you walked in the midst of the fire of the holiness of God. There was nothing wrong with this cherub when he was created. Nothing wrong at all. Verse 15. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until you changed yourself and unrighteousness was found in you. You were perfect. I had purpose for you. I had plans for you until the day you allowed something to come into your head, and you fell. You sinned. Unrighteousness was in you. Verse 16, by the abundance of your trade, here he's comparing Satan with the, <clears throat> with the ruler of Tyre, who was involved in trade. The trade, of course, of Satan is his interaction with people. By the abundance of your trade, you were 
internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Ah, it was pride. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. Pride. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you and see what pride did and how pride destroyed you. 1 Timothy 3, 6 is in a section that's describing the kind of person that the early church was to choose to be an elder or a leader in the church. And we break into the list of qualifications in verse 6. He was not to be a new convert, so that he, an overseer of the church, will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation that was incurred by the devil. Just affirming that... Satan's chief sin was this conceit, this pride. So far we've looked at the fall of the city of Tyre because of its pride. The fall of the ruler of Tyre because of its pride. And the fall of the king of Tyre, Satan, because of his pride. Pride is a very destructive thing. And that's why God hates pride. God, what is God's attitude toward pride? Well, we can look in Proverbs 6.16. There are six things that the Lord hates. There are seven that are detestable to Him. And the very first thing on the list is what? Haughty eyes. A person who has that look of proud, of pride. Proverbs 16, 5, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Proverbs 15, 25, the Lord tears down the house of the pride, but he sets the widow's boundary stones in place. James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God hates pride. He opposes it. Do you have a problem with pride? I, I think about this section in Ezekiel, and what strikes me is how that a creature who doesn't have a sin nature yet can be taken down so completely by pride. Now that should be a warning to all of us. That pride can just totally destroy you and your future. It can destroy you. Do you have a problem? How would we know if we have a problem with pride? How could we recognize pride in our lives. And part of the problem with pride is that it hides behind itself. Pride blinds us to itself. And unless we take an honest inventory of our actions and reactions and attitudes, we will not see it in our lives. So what does it look like in the earlier years of our country, Jonathan Edwards wrote an essay on the infection of pride in our lives. And I liked his title, the title of his essay, The Infection. It's like, uh-oh, you've got the disease. You're infected with it. And now it is taking its toll on you as a cancer in your life. Well, he, along with others, have contributed a list of some things. And so I've compiled from Edwards and others some things that, of what pride looks like in our lives. 
And the first one is it looks like fault finding. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus had some interesting things to say about pride. Some people think of themselves as self-appointed fruit inspectors. One person told one of my professors, God has given me the gift of discerning other people's faults. The professor replied, that's one talent God wouldn't mind you burying. Fault finding becomes addictive. It exposes the faults of others so you don't see your own. Jonathan Edwards wrote this. The spiritually proud person shows it in his fault finding with other saints. But the eminently humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart that he is not, that he is not apt to be very busy fixing other people. If you find yourself finding fault and being critical of others, then your heart is infected with that disease of pride. When was the last time you spoke a critical word to someone? Take inventory. Many years ago, I was listening to a radio um, broadcast of a psychologist, and he said to this family, I encourage you to um, use a tape recorder and record your conversations, and then go back and listen to what you said uh, over the course of the whole day. And in the radio broadcast, he said, so the family did that, and they were appalled at how much criticism uh, occupied their conversations. Would you be? Would you be surprised? Well, Jesus illustrated this principle like this. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. In other words, pride distorts your vision of other people and their problems. It distorts it. Second thing, a harsh spirit. Those who have been infected with the disease of pride speak of other sins and struggles with contempt and irritation and frustration and judgment. And things are said with harshness. I think it was Vance Havner who said, some people are like sandpaper. When you brush up against them, it always hurts. Jonathan Edwards said, Christians who are but fellow worms, ought at least to treat one another with as much humility and gentleness as Christ treats them. Philippians 4, 2 says, be completely humble and, and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. That means putting up with one another. The third one is what I want to call posing. Posing. Now, we've all been in front of a camera, and somebody wants to take your picture, and they want you to pose. Big smile, and I'll take the picture. So, or maybe you're posing in some, and, and you, you work at it to get, in a, to get this certain look. It's posing. But when pride infects the heart, we are more concerned with other people's perception of us than we are with the reality that's in our hearts. More concerned with how we appear than what we really are. In public, we pose. We're not genuine. We hide or think we hide our faults and mistakes, wanting to appear 
more perfect to others than we really are. Jesus spoke of a Pharisee who went to the temple to pray, and he made sure that he prayed loud enough that everybody could hear him, and he spoke of his own virtues. But Jesus said he went home still a condemned sinner. The poser tends to have, have pretty good success in the areas of holiness that have high visibility, but little concern for the disciplines that happen in secret. The poser pretends to be what he is not. It was Thomas Merton who said, Pride makes us artificial. Humility makes us real. The fourth thing is defensiveness. 1 John 1, 1.8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When pride infects the heart, we feel compelled to defend our wrong actions, make excuses for our ill behavior. Everybody makes mistakes. But if you have pride in your heart, it makes it hard for you to admit it. Do you make excuses for your sin or do you repent of it? Do you see yourself standing in the strength of Christ's righteousness or your own merit? His grace or the respect that you think you deserve? Our excuses are so often just simply sourced in our pride. The fifth thing is presumption before God. You know, you're never going to figure out why and what God will allow in your life. You'll never figure out all the ways of God. He will always surprise us. If we are presumptuous about the rules that God is supposed to follow in dealing with us, we may rebel against what we think is a line that God has crossed. Some people are very demanding of God. We have thought that we could define what is fair and unfair and permissible and not permissible in the ways of God. Job thought that way. So did his friends. They thought they had God figured out. You do good, God blesses you. You do bad, well, then bad things will happen to you. And so when bad things happened to Job, he couldn't figure it out. You'll never figure out God. But if we are presumptuous before God, it leads us to a heart that, that is proud and rebels against God. There's some people who think that God owes them certain blessings. God owes this to me. After all, look at what I've done for him. It is prideful to be presumptuous with God and to charge him with being unrighteous or unloving toward us. Don't let pride ruin your relationship with God. Humility recognizes we don't deserve anything of God's favor. Humility is not demanding of God. Number six is, that, uh, is desperate for attention and affirmation. Pride is hungry for attention and respect and affirmation. It seeks the compliments it thinks are due. Pride needs to be fed. And so it seeks the glory that comes from men instead of the glory that comes from God. In seeking recognition or appreciation, we may share with others our accomplishments in order to get their applause. In John 12, 43, it was said of the religious leaders, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And number seven, obsessed with physical appearance. Vanity is just another form of pride. Some people thrive on compliments about their attractiveness or their appearance. It's interesting to me that John the Baptist, great spiritual leader of the first century, made many public appearances, had many, many public meetings, and crowds would come there, but he was dressed in the rough material of poor people, camel's hair. Most religious leaders of that day would have never been caught dead wearing such humble cheap stuff. Pride says, I want to appear in a certain way so I will win the approval of others for my appearance. 
Some want the oohs and the ahs of being attractive to the opposite sex, and they seek to, seek to flaunt their attractiveness. When we think our value is based on our appearance, we probably have forgotten that man may look on the outside, but God looks at the heart. He sees what we really are. 1 Peter 3 says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as elaborate hair, hair styles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of the inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in the sight of God. Number eight is thinking you're too good for certain tasks. When we see ourselves as too good, we, we know that pride has infected us. If you think, I of all people should not have to do this, this task is for somebody else, then pride has infected your heart. If Jesus was willing to leave heaven and come to this earth and live as a servant and die as a servant, then why do I think I'm too good for some task? Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In John 13, verse 14, the last night that Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room, Jesus got up from the table. He took a pitcher of water and a towel and he went around the room and he washed the disciples' feet. And then he said, Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. We ought to have humility toward each other and do the lowliest tasks for each other. Number nine, pride shows itself in people who talk about themselves a lot. This is what I've accomplished. This is what I own. This is the title I have. This is the position I have. This is my financial status. These are the friends I hang out with. Look what I've been able to figure out. It's interesting that Jesus said in Matthew 6, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with, your, with trumpets. Don't have trumpets blaring. Everybody, attention over here. Da, 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 da. I'm giving to the needy. Oh. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Their pride brought them the applause of men, and that's all the reward they will get. In 1 Corinthians 1, I read that God has chosen the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. God doesn't want people bragging because you won't really ever accomplish anything. God is not the one who did it through you. Number 10, pride shows itself in another way when we are unwilling to submit to authority. This tenth sign of the infection of pride is an unwillingness to submit to authority. In this age, it's even to acknowledge that there is an authority over us. The attitude of many people today is, I want to be my own authority. I don't want to be told what to do or how to do it or when to do it. I'm my own boss. I'm the determiner of my own destiny. I don't want anybody over me. I want to be my own God. But I'll tell you, being your own God is going to be short-lived. There's coming a day when Romans 14, 11 will be true of everyone. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. God is against people who 
rebel against authority. Not just his, but the authorities he has set up in this world. Proverbs 30 says, The eye that mocks a father that scorns an aged mother will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by vultures. It's a poetic way of saying, if you don't have respect for your father and your mother, you won't see life very well. You'll have the wrong perspective on life. You'll never be able to see yourself and others as they really are. Number 11 is indignation when others are honored but you are not. Psalm 115 verse 1. Not to us, Lord. Not to us. It's emphatic. But to your name be the glory. Because of your love and your faithfulness. That's the things to focus on. The love of God and the faithfulness of God. Pride has infected us. When there's indignation, when other people are recognized and honored and you are not, you're glossed over, you're forgotten. Have you ever felt envious and indignant when other people receive recognition and you were glossed over? Well, that too comes from our pride. Not to us, Lord. Not to us. But to your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness. Number 12 is dis, dis, uh, despising a certain kind of person. Maybe you look down on people who are of a different color or a different nationality or less intelligent than you are. Maybe you despise those who need help figuring out what is so simple for you to figure out? After all, I had it figured out a long time ago. What's wrong with you? You stupid or something? Maybe you can't stand people who have emotional problems or some other difficulty in life, and you quickly use your, 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 lose your patience with them. Ephesians 4.2 is an antidote for that. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in your love. You know, when we think about, well, how am I supposed to live? We turn to Jesus. There's no better role model for a humble life than that of Jesus. He showed by example that humble living is to live as a servant. Jesus said to his disciples, in the world, among the Gentiles, they lorded over each other. Uh, they're proud of their authority they have over each other. But it's not to be that way with you. In the economy of God, the greater you are, the more people you serve. And the greatest is the servant to everybody. It's not the way the world works. It's not the way your job works. But it's the economy of God in the church of Jesus Christ. Peter said in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, he said, to the religious leaders, don't lord it over each other. What does that mean? Don't become people's boss and think, I can tell you what to do because I outrank you. Jesus said, that doesn't belong in the church. Instead, we're to imitate the servanthood of Jesus Christ. But as Paul put the stethoscope to the heart of the church at Philippi, he detected the murmur of pride. They were living selfishly, thinking of their own personal prosperity, not caring what happened to each other. And so he, he put before them the role model of Jesus, and this is what he wrote. 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Well, that's not easy to do, is it? Not look into your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that's why God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So we wind up with a huge contrast. Who was a cherub who lifted himself up and was destroyed? And here's the Son of God who humbled himself and was exalted. And we're called to watch out for the first and to copy the second. Pride is so destructive. Pride destroyed Satan. It destroyed Tyre. It destroyed the ruler of Tyre. And where Satan is king, he destroys a society. He destroys a life. He threatens to destroy every one of us. And he wants to use pride. <clears throat> My question to you is, is he doing it? Let's pray. Our Father, in all of our relationships at Avondale Baptist Church, I pray we would be known for humility. We'd be known for servanthood. We'd be known not as those who lord it over each other, but as those who esteem others better than ourselves. I pray your blessing upon your word in our lives. Change us to honor and glorify a humble Savior. And we pray in the name of our wonderful, exalted Lord and for his eternal glory. Amen. Let's stand together. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and dominion both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. We're dismissed.